In this video, we'll talk about something called closures, which are ways of calculating functional dependencies and the keys of using, once again, this thing called closures, which will make a lot more sense when I actually tell you what they are. Okay, so a closure test is a way of checking whether or not a given functional dependency can be inferred given other functional dependencies. So let's say that I hand you a bunch of functional dependencies we call f, okay, that says x functionally determines a, x1 functionally determines a1, x2 functionally determines a2, xn functionally determines an. Those are all the functional dependencies. And we want to know whether or not y functionally determines b, okay? We want to know whether or not this particular functional dependency must hold in any relation that satisfies all the other functional dependencies. Why we might want to do this, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so a way of testing this, a way of proving that why function determines b given all these other functional dependencies is to compute the closure of f denoted by f plus. The little plus means closure. Okay? And so the all of the functional dependencies that are logically implied by f is called the closure of f. Okay? So every possible functional dependency that must hold given f are call, is called the closure of f. So the, what you can do is we can check is y functionally determines b implied by the functional dependencies of a given set of attributes by looking at if y is functionally determined b is in the closure of f. All right, so the way that you go about doing this is your base case is, well, we need to calculate the closure, is you say, well, the base case is all of the functional dependencies we know about are the ones we were given. Okay, and then what we do is we use induction. We basically look at the functional dependencies left side and check if those things are currently already in our, um, uh, excuse me, we check if the functional dependencies left side X is currently already in the functional closure of Y. Basically we're saying if the X functional determinants Y, then add A to Y star if we already have X. And you know, once again, this will make a bit more sense if we actually go through this through some examples. All right, so the one thing that we need to do is we need to actually go through, well, how can we infer new functional dependencies? And the way that we do this is by using what's called an inference axiom. An inference axiom is a rule that states whether or not if a relation satisfies these FDs, it must also satisfy these other functional dependencies. Okay? A rule, a set of inference rules is sound if those rules only lead to true conclusions. This is a little bit of like proof talk here. If it's sound, it means you can only use those rules to generate true conclusions. And it's complete if they can generate everything that um, we care about. In this case, they are complete if we can use it to generate every functional dependency on a relation. All right? And so the axioms that I'm going to be teaching you are called Angstrom's axioms. Arm, excuse me, Armstrong's axioms. And this is my, my favorite um, uh, Lieutenant Armstrong here. Okay, so the first rule is pretty easy. Um, it's called reflexivity, or I like to call it triviality, that says if all of the attributes y are a subset of x, then x functionally determines y. Basically, if all the things on the right side are also on the left side, then the left side determines the right side. That's pretty obvious. All right. Another one, just maybe a little bit less obvious, is called augmentation. If x functionally determines y, then zx functionally determines zy. Okay, that seems pretty stupid, right? If you stick Z on both sides, of course, that's still true, right? Because if Z is on the left side, then Z can be on the right side. That's called augmentation. And the last rule is called transitivity. If X functionally determines Y and Y functionally determines Z, then X also functionally determines Z. Does that make sense? If two rows that have the same X must have the same Y, and two rows that have the same Y must have the same Z, then two rows that have the same X must have the same Z. That's transitivity. And the nice thing about these three rules is none of them are too complicated, and these rules are both sound and complete, meaning by using these rules, you can build every possible functional dependency allowed within a particular relation. All right, so let's work through an example. So we have a relation which has the letters A, B, C, G, H, I. I just picked letters at random. And I generated a bunch of functional dependencies. A functionally determines B, C, A functionally determines C, and so forth. 
okay? So what are some members of the closure of F? What are some members of the closure of F? Well, does A functionally determine H? Yes. Well, how do we get there? Well, we can get there by transitivity, okay? We know A functionally determines B, right? That's, that's in the F that we were just given. We also know that B functionally determines H. That's that last rule there. So by using transitivity, we know A functionally determines H. All right, that one wasn't too bad. How about another one? Does AG functionally determine I? Well, this one's a little bit harder to construct, but we start with A functionally determines C, right? That's the second rule of F. And then we augment it by adding a G on both sides. So now we have AG functionally determines CG. Okay, we're so good so far. And hey, look, CG functionally determines I. And so by using transitivity, we can get that AG functionally determines I. And you can do this for a lot of other ones. These are just some examples of using those axioms to build new functional dependencies. All right. Now, how do you go about this in a systematic way to calculate all possible um, attributes in the closure of F? Well, here you use a not too hard algorithm. So to compute the complete closure of the functional dependencies of F, aka the closure of F, what you do is you start with by saying the closure of F are, is F. Those are all the attributes that you were given. And then you repeat this loop forever uh, until you reach a certain point, I guess. Um, you repeat for each functional dependency F in the closure of F, for all the functional dependencies you've already determined, you can apply reflexivity and augmentation rules on F. So you can apply all of the um, uh, possible subset rules on F. You can apply all of the possible augmentations on F. And you can add the, what, the new functional dependencies you generated to F star. Okay, not too bad. Also, you need to apply that third rule, the rule of transitivity. For every pair of functional dependencies, if F1 and F2 can be combined using transitivity, then you can add the resulting function dependency to F. So basically, if the right side of one matches the left side on the other, you can combine the two to generate a new rule. And you keep doing this until you can't add any more function dependencies, until you've tried to find new rules by reflexivity, augmentation, and transitivity, and you couldn't find any more, then you're done. And you can return that as F star. All right, so let's try doing this by hand. So here is a admittedly small relation here. It has first name, ID, last name, and username. And there are two functional dependencies that apply here. If I give you the username, that functionally determines the first name and the last name. And if I give you the last name, that functionally determines the ID. So the question is, is username functionally determines username ID in F star? Okay, so let's work our way through this. So there's a couple different ways we could try to derive this, but the way I'm gonna do is, okay, we start with username functionally determines first name and last name, okay? Which is the same thing as username functionally determines first name, username functionally determines last name. And if username, and um, if I have last name, I can get to ID. So username functionally determines ID. And if username functionally determines ID, I can always take anything on the right side and add it to the left side, or excuse me, I can only take anything on the left side and add it to the right side. So if I have username function determines ID, I can always get username function determines username ID. So is username functionally determines username ID in F star? Yes. Now, is this a trivial functional dependency? No, but actually almost all of the functional dependencies in the closure are trivial, except for some of them. Um, is username function determines username ID in F star? No. Well, it is, even though it's not in F, most of the um, function dependencies in F, in F plus, in the closure of F, aren't in F. They're all these kind of inferences you make from there. And does this ever depend on the relations tuples? No. Like the rule is if you have the same username, you have the same first name and last name, and if you have the same last name, you have the same ID, then it will always be the truth that if you have the same username, you will have the same username and ID. That is a tenet of how functional dependencies work. All right, next thing I wanna talk about is a different type of closure. It's a type of closure called attribute sets, okay? 
So the way this works is if you're given a set of attributes, which here I'm just calling alpha because that's the standard notation for how do you denote attribute sets, um, the closure of a set of attributes under f, which are a bunch of functional dependencies, is denoted by alpha plus. Okay, So plus, once again, means closure here. Um, and these are the set of attributes that are functionally determined by alpha under f. Now, okay, this sounds really complicated. Basically, all it means is, given a set of attributes alpha, what are all of the other attributes that are functionally determined by alpha as well? All right, so the way that you generate this isn't too bad. So to calculate the closure of alpha under f, you start with by saying, okay, what are all the things that I are functionally determined by alpha? Well, obviously everything in alpha is functionally determined by alpha. That's a pretty easy start. And then you say, while you found new things to add, do this. And what do you do? For each functional dependency in F, so each beta functionally determines gamma, and if beta, if all the things on the left side are already in the result, if all the things on the left side are already in the attributes that you've determined, then you can add all of the things in the gamma, you can add all of the things on the right side into your result because all of those things are now functionally determined by things you've already calculated. All right, so that once again, sounds really complicated. What we're gonna do is we're going to uh, walk through an example. All right, so what we have here is another relation and we have a bunch of functional dependencies. And I wanna know if I give you AG, what are all of the other attributes you can get to from there? Okay, so let's start with, our result starts with AG. Like what are the things we can get to? We can definitely get to AG if you give me AG. All right, that's not too bad. Where do we go from here? Well, you can add C and G to the result set because if you have A, you can get to C. So you can add that to the result. And if you have A, you can get to B. You can add that to the result. And why can you add C and B? Because A was already in the result. A was already a subset of the things in the result. So you can add C and B in there, okay? Not too bad. Hey, now we can use um, uh, uh, transitivity here. So if I have C and G in the um, result, which I already do, I can add H because C and G functionally determines H and C, G is already in the result, great. And using that also, if I have C, G, I can also add I in there. Why? Because C, G is already in the result and C, G functionally determines I. And at this point, I have everything in there. There's no more things I can add to my attribute set. So one nice thing is, is AG a key? Well, actually, that's a little hard to determine at first. Here's an easier question. Is AG a super key? Well, which, which is another way of saying, um, is AG, is the closure of AG include all of the attributes of R? Is the closure of AG a subset of, or excuse me, a superset of R. And the answer here is, well, the closure of AG includes everything in R. So the answer here is yes, AG is a super key. Given AG, I can get to everything else. All right. Now, in order to determine whether AG is a key, we need to make sure it's a super key, which it is, great. But we also need to make sure no subset of AG is a super key as well. So we gotta check those. Is any subset of AG a super key? For instance, is A a super key? Is the closure of A include all of R? Well, we can start with A, with A we can get to B, with A we can get to C, so now we have A, B, C, and with B we can get to H, so I got A, B, C, H. Can I go any further? No, because the rest of the ones, I have no way of getting to things like G or I. So is A a super key? No, because the closure of A doesn't include all of the attributes. All right, we also need to check G. Is G a super key? Well, if I start with G, what can I get to? I can't get to anywhere. There's no, um, just starting with G, the only attribute that I can functionally determine with G is G itself. So is G a super key? No. So if AG is a super key and none of the subsets are super keys, AG is a key. All right, so there are many ways in which we might want to use these attribute set closures. All right, the first one is what I just showed you, testing for super keys. You can test if alpha is a super key by computing the closure of alpha and then check if the closure of alpha contains all of the attributes of R. That's not too bad. The other thing that's really useful is you can actually use it to test functional dependencies. This is another way to check if say the functional dependency alpha determines beta holds. 
or in other words, to say if it is in F star, it's just to check if beta is a subset of all of the things functionally determined by alpha. So we can compute the attribute closure of alpha and then check if it contains beta, okay? Because if it does contain beta, then beta is functionally determined by alpha. And so this is a really easy way to check, is this functional dependency in um, the closure of F? And another way that you can do this is you can just basically say, for every subset of R, we can find the attribute set of that particular um, closure. And then for every um, subset of that, we can compute a functional dependency by saying, OK, we basically check for every possible attribute set, what are all the things you can infer? And all of those are now functional dependencies. All right, so let's go back to our previous example. And let's see if we can use attribute set closure to calculate, for instance, is username, last name a key for R? All right, so what we do is we, we're calculating the attribute set closure. So we start with, well, what things do we have in our attribute set closure? We have username and last name. Okay, using those two, can we get anywhere else? Well, yeah, if we have last name, we can get to ID. So now we have username, last name, ID. Can we do anything else? Well, if we have username, we can get from username to first name. So now we have username, first name, last name, ID. So is username, last name a key for R? Well, it's a super key, that's for sure. Now, is are any subsets of it also keys? Or excuse me, are any subsets of it also super keys? Well, let's do the easy one. If we have last name, we can get from last name to last name, and then we can also get from last name to ID but we have no way of going from last name to first name or from last name to user ID. So is last name a super key? No. Is username a super key? Well, we start with, okay, we got username. We can get from username to first name. We can get from username to last name and we can get from last name to ID. So is username a super key? Yes. So the correct answer here is, is username, last name a key? It's not, but it is a super key, but it's not a key.